What's up, good people? I hope you all are doing great. Today, I'm going to talk about an interesting topic uh, that's one of the important causes of blindness. And it leads to blindness because it is genetic. And that's why I really want to emphasize on this topic here, because there are some people who go blind and it's not like their lifestyle has caused this or it's not like they did something, but it's genetics. And the condition is called best disease. Uh, the complicated name or the scientific name for that is vitaliform macular dystrophy. Excuse my cough. <clears throat> so I'm going over a case study here that I had a patient who first came to our practice in 2015, a uh, 74-year-old male and complains of blurriness at distance and basically he wants a diabetic eye exam and when we look at his ocular medical and social history we see he has type 2 diabetes cataracts hypertension and benign prostatic hypertrophy and increased lipase coronary artery disease uh cr chronic serious otitis media that's an ear infection and tobacco smoking, uh, one to two pipes per day. Uh, besides that, uh, he's taking these medications like insulin, metformin, aspirin, carvedilol, and hydrochlorothiazide for blood pressure and finasteride for the BPH. And when we look at the VAs of this patient, that's what we see. The right eye is 2030 minus one, and left eye is 2040 minus two. And with the refraction, we are able to fine tune it to 2025 and 2030. So we are getting a one line improvement there. And confrontations are good, EOMs uh, are good, and the pupils are perfect at this point. And then let's look at the front and the back of the eyes, and pretty unremarkable interiorly, except for a little bit of pinguicula OU in both eyes. Nerves look healthy and retina look healthy on the fundoscopy, like uh, no clinically significant macular edema in both eyes, no vasculopathy from the diabetes. Everything looks healthy in the periphery as well. And same goes with the anterior chamber. We just see a little bit of cataracts in both eyes and the pressures are also good. 17 both eyes with applination. And the management plan at this point is stress the importance of blood glucose control and return in one year. Patient was educated about the cataracts and we ordered new glasses for that. And interestingly, somebody was very smart and somebody was there keen enough to pick something in the back that gave some suspicion so that we went forward with a thing called OCT. We did the OCT and that's what we see here. This is the OCT of right eye and we see a small thing right there. A small swelling, small thing. And that is 2015, November. And so we just started monitoring for that because we need to we need to make sure what's going on. And looking at that same eye from 2015 till 2017, that's how it's progressing. You see, it's a little bigger. It's a little bigger until 2017, starting from 2015, 2016, and then 2017. And that's the right eye. Let's go to the left eye. That how did the left eye progress in 2015? Here, we are not seeing anything in the left eye, unlike the right eye. But in the next year, we see a little bit of hump here in 2016. And then the hump goes a little bit higher in the next year, which is 2017. That's how it's progressing. And let's keep checking on the progress that, okay, what happened to the right eye now? We are in 2020, and the hump has started getting more and more obvious look at that look at that the hump is getting more and more obvious and we can see a change of plus 20 microns 
So the swelling or that landmark that we observed in 2015 in the right eye has gotten here up till this point that yes, there is a thing that you cannot ignore and you cannot uh, just miss it, it's huge. And looking at the left eye from 2020 to 2022, that's how it's looking like. The hump is there getting bigger, bigger and bigger. So what that condition is, we diagnosed it as vitelliform macular dystrophy. And during this whole time period, our management plan was you look at it, you educate the patient, and you start them on AIDS, which is I vitamins, twice a day and keep monitoring on six monthly basis. And how do you do that? You do it with OCT and DFE, which is dilated fundus exam. And we also gave the Amsler grid for home monitoring so that if there is any sudden change, the patient should report to us immediately. So what is a best disease? What is a vitaliform macular dystrophy? Let's start with symptoms. Uh, I know this picture on the left right here is <laughs> very catchy. That's how it looks like. But the patient will come to you with the complaint of decreased vision, metamorphopsia, scotomas, and Sometimes the patient will have no symptoms. Like this patient of ours, when that patient came in 2015, patient was coming there just for a diabetic eye exam and maybe a little bit of blurriness, but still we were able to get the vision to 2025 or so. And the signs are pretty remarkable. When you look at it, you can see a yellow round subretinal lesion as I am showing right here in the picture. And it looks like a classic egg yolk appearance. That's the hallmark sign of best disease or vitelliform macular dystrophy. And it is typically bilateral, but again, there could be a slight lag between the two eyes as we saw in our patient as well. But again, there is a bilateral, typical bilateral progression. And 10% of the cases have multiple and extra foveal involvement as well. And 20% can get the choroidal neovascular membrane and hemorrhaging and atrophic scarring. And also you get the abnormalities in the EOG and ERG specifically remains normal in this kind of patient. So for best disease, that's how the EOG or electrooculography is gonna look like this is a normal person, and this is the best disease person. Look at the best disease person. You barely see any spiking there, which is the normal spiking is like this. But here, in best disease, that's what you see. You barely see any amplitudes, and that's what is the game changer. That's where you find out that this is a condition that's causing this problem, and it is a genetic condition. It is inherited as an autosomal dominant fashion. And the gene involved is best one gene. And the carriers may have normal fundi, but still you can have an abnormal EOG. So if somebody is carrying that gene and did not express it, still you can find abnormal electrooculographic findings. And that's how you can trace it and monitor it. So the typical progression is laid out here in the picture on the left here, where you see pre-vitaliform stage and then vitaliform stage and vital eruptive and pseudohypopion atrophic stage and fibro fibrotic cicatrical stage. And this is where you start seeing very much decline in the vision of the patient. In the early stages, there's barely any complaint because the patient will not notice and the stage A here, the pre-vitaliform stage, is something that is even hard to catch sometimes without uh, the sophisticated testing that we are doing here called OCG. Uh, so that's how it progresses. But uh, Good thing is it has a delayed onset. Like my patient is 
literally 74 years at the time of presentation. And when I saw this patient last month, he is above 80. So the good part of this disease is uh, it presents late and still there is still certain level of vision that patient can enjoy and live with. So what's the differential diagnosis? What other things can look like it? Age-related macular degeneration can certainly look like it. Central serous choroidopathy, fundus flabby maculatus disease or Stargardt disease, resolving subretinal hematomas, basal laminar drusen. So these things can resemble uh, your best disease or vitaliform macular dystrophy. So what kind of workup do you want for your patient? Uh, as you can see on the right side, I'm showing different things that we can do. Uh, let's talk about it. Like you, you can do the family history. You can talk to the patient and discuss with them about the family history. If there is anybody in the family with genetic blindness or have a complete ocular exam, do the OCT, do the EOG, as I showed in the previous slide, that EOG is very important. Even for carriers, you can catch it. So EOG is very specific and very confirmatory. Genetic testing for best one disease, for best one gene mutation. Yes, you can do it. Not necessarily, but yeah, it it holds its place. IVFA to rule out any choroidal neovascularization. That's also something that is done usually. And treatment. There is no effective treatment. Unfortunately, there is no effective treatment for best disease. There is a controversy about choroidal neovascularization, and CNV may, may heal without any devastating visual loss. And that's where we end up giving anti-VEGF because, you know, because there is vascularization going on, we need to stop that and we give it Lucentis or Ilia or Avastin to take care of that. PDT and focal laser are also helpful. The thing is, PDT is good because uh, you are right in a subfoveal area. If you look at the OCT, this location is very critical. So uh, PDT can help in serious cases. And yeah, patients should have polycarb lenses at all time, especially during sports. And that becomes critical. Uh, so in summary, in a nutshell, there's no effective or target treatment, but there are ways to get rid of complications. There are ways to rehab your patient. There are ways to make the patient work or function effectively in the society. CNV should be treated properly. That's one of the important things, uh, take home things. Another important thing is Amsler grid. You have to have an Amsler grid at home, stuck to the fridge, stuck to the closet, stuck somewhere so that you are able to check your one eye at a time and return immediately. If changes are noticed in the vision or in the Amsler grid, you have to come to the clinic immediately because we need those testing as I was discussing in the previous slide, like OCT, EOG, and IVFA. So we have to make sure. What are some of the takeaways? Most important is early detection. I am very glad that we detected our patient very early and there was barely a mark over there <laughs> to be honest that was very impressive and the patient was so happy about it patient was very thankful that he was diagnosed and he knows what to do and he goes to low vision clinic as that's one of the takeaways vision rehab vision rehab is very important in these patients genetic counseling is very important in these patients and monitoring 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 that's all we are doing here and making sure that if there is a slightest thing of uh, cnvm uh, we need to urgently refer the patient to a retina specialist and get it taken care then and there there's no delays that we are going to wait because we have options we have options for anti-vegf we have options for focal laser we have 
options of uh, PDT. So options are there and we also need to utilize the whole team that we are gonna imply here, like low vision clinic is very important. Genetic counseling is very important. And of course, early detection is all that's gonna make a huge difference here. Here are some of my references. Please uh, ask me any questions if you have any in the comment section. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.